In this video, I'll be talking about the Power Macintosh 8100. The 8100 was introduced March 14, 1994, discontinued August 5, 1995, a PowerPC601 processor running at 80, 100, and 110 MHz. It came with 8 or 16 MB of RAM installed. Every collector of Macs has a list of models they are on the hunt for. It is a different list for everyone, as unique as their experiences, and it never includes the Performa 6200. Topping my list for well over a decade has been the 8100, mostly because it was way out of my reach when I bought my 6100 back in 1994. I mean, check out these base prices. But I've never seen one being sold on the local used market. I haven't so much as seen one in person, but to celebrate hitting 8100 subscribers, I'm going to do a video. I'll try not to overlap with my 6100 video because that one has a lot of the same information. On March 14th, 1994. Hey, hey, hey. No overlap. Long before the first PowerPC chip, and long before IBM, Motorola, and Apple teamed up to create the PowerPC, Apple wanted to build a computer product based on the fast, modern RISC microprocessor technology. For seeing Motorola's 68K chips, not to mention Intel's x86 line, as a technological dead end. Those chip designs were retroactively referred to as CISC, referring to complex instructions. A team called Jaguar was created with an Apple to build the system while management went shopping for a supplier of a RISC processor. Similar to how the Mac was not backward compatible with the Apple II, management had decided this successor machine would not be backward compatible to the Mac, wanting a clean break from the 68K CPU. The reason being that this RISC machine was going to be so powerful it would open up a new class of advanced software possibilities, quickly obsoleting current Macintosh software and enticing the big developers to port their software to RISC for the massive speed gains. But a group of Apple engineers led by Jack McHenry were not so optimistic on that plan, and they formed a competing team called Cognac. The goal? To work on an alternate RISC design that did allow backward compatibility to the Macintosh. This would be made possible thanks to a 60K emulator written by Gary Davidian. This emulator would turn out to be as critical to the success of the Power Macintosh transition as the mouse was to the original Mac. They called their project Piltdown Man to commemorate the early 20th century discovery of the fossil that was the missing link between apes and man, and was an elaborate hoax. Engineering, Engineering sense of humor, I guess. Jaguar would be the high-end machine, and Piltdown Man would be the low-end machine. Time passed, and instead of being a separate entity with an Apple, Jaguar was folded into the Macintosh group, and the team changed the project name to Hurricane, with the tagline, Prepare to be blown away. And once the PowerPC was chosen as the RISC processor, the name changed again to It has arrived. Instead of just producing no code names, Cognac actually produced results. The Cognac team had Piltdown Man up and running on the new PowerPC 601 processor within a week. When the January 24, 1994 Power Macintosh release date was imposed, it wasn't long before Apple learned that Tesseract was way too ambitious. And suddenly Piltdown Man was the only working option, and would now need to be the basis for the entire Power Macintosh lineup. Jack McHenry ensured early on that the Piltdown Man board design could be extended in case this happened. Piltdown Man, aka the Power Macintosh 6100, was ready for the original January 24th release date, being the 10th anniversary of Macintosh. But Apple decided to wait a couple months until the 7100 and 8100 could be made ready to ship immediately and in volume. Using Cognac's 6100 board as a base design, the mid range 7100 added new bus expansion slots and the 8100 high-end version added internal SCSI 2 on top of that. There was also the lesser-known 9100 class machine, which was a server only, taking the 8100 board design and adding a fourth new bus card slot, also with a twist on the large Quadra 900 tower design. This was one of many examples of engineers saving Apple from the failures of management. Even though Tesseract was cancelled, Oddly enough, the 1995 second generation Power Mac, the 7500, would be based on a new motherboard design named TNT, which stood for the new Tesseract. 
prepare to be blown up. <laughs> Gurry. And what about Jaguar? Only a few remnants of Jaguar's work saw the light of day. Like plain talk? Computer, tell me a joke. Knock, knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange, you're glad you bought a Power Macintosh. I'll get back to you on that. They developed the GeoPort, the Apple adjustable keyboard, cool, the audio vision display, and they originated the industrial design for the Center 610. A lot of people do like the slimline design of the LC, so we tried to maintain that design language with the Macintosh Sentra 610. Uh -huh. As you can see, it's low profile. On the other hand, multimedia is now a big uh, thing in the industry, so we're incorporating here in the middle a bay that can accommodate an internal CD-ROM player. Mm -hmm. And the design for the Quadra 800. If we turn it to the side, you'll see that we've mounted the motherboard actually vertical in the enclosure, so without removing the power supply or any of the disk drives, we can drop the motherboard out. Yeah, I think I prefer the earlier machines where I had to remove the power supply and drives. The highest performance model is the 8180, clocking in at 80 megahertz. Oh yeah, we're talking about the 8100, aren't we? Continuing with the hoax theme, the 8100 was codenamed Cold Fusion. There was a lot of hype surrounding the release of the Power Macintosh, though in no way was it a surprise to anyone since they had been selling PowerPC upgrade cards to Quadra users since January. There were five models of 8100 made. The 80 MHz was the first model, introduced March 14, 1994, along with an AV model. These representing the flagship of the new Power Macintosh line. IBM and Motorola have announced that a 100 MHz version of the 601 will ship in volume in the fourth quarter of 94. I was just getting to that actually was a 110 megahertz introduced in a special power user model in November 1994. And believe me, that speed jump blew everyone away. One of the not so rare times that Apple declared they had the fastest personal computer you can buy. The fastest Macintosh ever and the fastest personal computer on the market. We're building the fastest machines in the PC industry. The new Power Mac G4, the most powerful personal computer ever brought to market. In fact, it's the world's most powerful personal computer, period. And one of the most expensive Macs Apple had introduced in a long time, going north of 5,000 US dollars. Like by a lot. 110 is kind of an odd number, but they could not get enough 120 megahertz chips from IBM at the time. And then in January 1995, they speed bumped the standard 80 megahertz models to 100 megahertz yet dropping the base price $550 to $36.99. And the 110 remained available at the much higher price. Although these later models were quite scarce if you were looking to buy one, thanks to Apple's poor management at the time. You don't understand the marketplace. Yeah, pretty much. The processor used in the 80 MHz was the PowerPC 601 but the 100 and 110 MHz 8100s used a die shrunk revision called the 601 Plus, aka 601V. The same thing, just shrunk from a 121mm square die to a 74mm square, helping it run cooler. This was accomplished by going from a 650nm to a 500nm transistor width. That's 500 times thinner than the width of a human hair. Yeah, whatever. The 601 was 25 years ago. Give, give him a break. The processor was mounted on a ceramic quad flat pack with 304 pins. Uh, I think I'm getting over my head here. Tutorial 80. Have fun. Oh. You'll find many Macintosh history websites are confused by the order of release. Especially bad is the opinion site Apple Matters. The Power Macintosh 8100 was introduced in March 1994. It got a speed bump to 100 megahertz in November of that year, and 110 megahertz in January 1995. At which point it was discontinued. What? Hey, I'm just reading it, pal. To be fair, Apple Matters has not been updated since 2011, about the time Steve Jobs passed away. I wonder. Apple Matters was a good site overall but now lies frozen in time, and spam popping up like weeds in all the cracks. 
This is exactly what I was looking for. Thanks for sharing this great article. That is very interesting. I love reading and I am always searching for informative information, like payday loans online. And there was no AV version of the 110 MHz, so don't believe every Mac.com or the book Apple Confidential 2.0. And I know rather than just complain I should do something about it, I can at least go in and correct Wikipedia, which is also wrong. As Steve Jobs would advise, never settle for the status quo. While I do this, I want to welcome new viewers to this channel, who are now asking themselves why they signed up to watch some dude edit a Wikipedia page. Amazingly, after my last video, more people subscribed that month than did in the 10 years before that. I don't know if it was disproportionate interest in the Apple Network server, positive word of mouth about the channel, YouTube's algorithm, or just people not knowing what to do with themselves in the midst of a pandemic. By the way, remember life before the pandemic? Barbarians. Okay, so the 110 came before the 100 megahertz, and there was no AV version of the 110 megahertz. Perfect. Oddly, these facts were correct in the model list on the same page. Using a strategy first marketed by Intel's 46DX2 chip, the 80 megahertz 601 was clocked doubled from the 40 megahertz motherboard bus speed. But the new 601 Plus chips were clocked tripled. So in the 100 megahertz, that meant that it has a 33.3 megahertz bus. It makes the system much faster, though not three times faster, because the bus can be a bottleneck. Now, I had recently been in touch with a guy looking to sell off his Mac collection, and I bought a Pismo G3 PowerBook and QuickTake 100 camera. He wasn't willing to part with his original Macintosh or 8600, and I don't blame him. I did see what looked like an 8500 shoved under the shelving. He said no, it was an 8100. What? I couldn't believe it, but there it was. An 8100-100 AV. He said it did not boot, and I ended up getting it in trade for some ADB keyboards and mice. And he threw in this Quadra 605. Also non-functional, but pretty good cosmetic condition. Maybe a... Yes, pretty nice, and maybe a candidate for a future video. As for the 8100, not working and not in perfect condition, but I am extremely happy to finally get one. Filling the gap between the Quadra 800 from 1993 and my 8500 from 96. The power button is in the back and is the locking type. At the front are the reset interrupt buttons. It's the same as the Quadra 800, whereas the next gen 8500 would have a front panel power button with reset interrupt buttons removed altogether. Anyway, let's see what's going on inside. When I take off the cover, the speaker is full of sawdust. Mm -hmm. Let me check the expansion cards and the AV card. Oh, what the hell? Does not start up. Okay, so there's the AV card that it came with, hence the model name. It could not be purchased as an upgrade part after the fact. This 8100 came with two hard drives. Uh, nice hard drive mount there, bud. Luckily I have some spare hard drive sleds that I can attach. A 1GB IBM drive and a 1GB digital drive. Apple offered 500MB or 1GB drives in the 8180, 700 or 1GB in the 100, and a huge 2GB in the 110. While testing these drives in my 8500 machine, the digital brand drive sounds like it's going to break itself apart when it stops, but maybe that's just normal. Jeez. Unnerving with this old equipment. The lower full height bay was meant for physically larger high performance hard drives, 
connected to the double-speed SCSI 2 bus. Like I said, the case design originated with Jaguar and is universally disliked for accessibility. And sure enough, the previous owner just hulked out and broke off the top two drive bezels, hence the masking tape to hold them on, and the third bezel is completely missing. These bezels are almost impossible to replace, and even if you do find a replacement, the degree of yellowing probably won't match. But here's a possible solution that is even better than masking tape. Once you take the cover off, lift the computer like so, and then shake it. As suspected, the broken pieces were still inside the case from the previous owner's Hulk session. I'll try to glue these back with ABS plumbing cement. I see they now have a clear cement option rather than the standard yellow, so I'd recommend that. I need to remove the entire front panel because even some of the clips holding the front panel to the metal cover were broken off. Dude! Remove the screws holding the front on. and open it like a door until the plastic clips are free. I found the broken clips, so let's glue those back. I'm using a high-tech tool to apply the glue, as you can see. The drive bezels are designed to hook into the panel at the left side and snap in place with these clips with finger-like supports on the right side. I can't imagine why these broke. As for the missing bezel, I like the 8500, but I like the 8100 more. To remove the bezel from the 8500 without just breaking it like they did on the 8100, I hit it with heat from a hair dryer. That should soften the plastic enough. I pull over the latch, then angle it out. There we have it. Okay, I went too high with the heat and it didn't spring back in shape, but easy enough to fix. Yeah, pretty good match with the rest of the 8100 front. With that done, I can reattach the front panel to the metal frame, just like a door hinge. Don't forget there's a clip at the top of the case. There, much better. Okay, so that's done. Hey, one other thing. On the inside wall of the case, there is a metal spiro gyra thing not present on the 800 or 8500. You just do anything? Seems to ground the case to the power supply. Whether this was original or an add-on, I don't know. If you know what this is, please leave a comment. All right, let's see if we got anything in the comments. Okay, nothing helpful yet, but I'm interested to know. Since the case was using the same mold as the Quadra 800, the 8100 also had the molded signatures of the designers under the power supply. I wish I could say I was impressed with their work. By the 8500, changes to the internal design meant it did not carry on these signatures. Regarding the new bus cards in this 8100, there's a long 12-inch Audio Media 2 card. It worked with sound designer software. This seems to have been the main purpose of this machine in its working life. The 8100 has a removable card support bracket for long cards like this, which you'll also find in the Quadra 800. Lastly, an Asante Ethernet card, featuring what we now know as a standard Ethernet jack, plus an AUI port. The machine's built-in Ethernet being Apple's custom version of AUI. Instead of screws, they decide to mold clips into the case to hold the cards in place. What a bad idea. Hey, here's a 8100-110 on display at a museum in Germany. Great website. Uh, wait, 
introduced January 1995. As a side note, clone licensing was made official in November 1994, and by spring 1995, clone units started to appear. The Radius System 100, copying the 8100's mini tower shape very closely. And then a lower cost model, aping the name with the Radius 81110. Similarly, there was this sub-licensed Mac Warehouse concoction of the Radius system. Okay, I have extracted the motherboard. It has a 100 megahertz speed bump label on it. Even with the die shrink of the 601 CPU, Apple was apparently not happy with the heat generated. So when we look at the CPU, sandwiched between the heatsink and the processor was a Peltier cooling device. You can see it wired to the board for power. It uses a thermoelectric effect to actively move heat to the heatsink side, thereby cooling the CPU surface. Now in this case, it's not white because it's ceramic. The device is sealed in foam to prevent condensation from forming. Critics argue that the Peltier's operation actually creates more net heat inside the computer. These devices are generally the domain of people trying to overclock processors beyond the manufactured rating. So putting one of these coolers in a commercial product maybe hints at desperation. The 8100, 110, and 100 were the first Macs, in fact, first personal computers with a CPU cooler. Later, the 120 MHz 9150 workgroup server and some 7200s would also use them, but this thing did not catch on, I'll say that. Now, even Apple's service manual says do not disassemble the Peltier device, so I'm not going to mess with it. The AV card featured a standard monitor port plus analog video in and out. Non-AV 8100s, like the 8100-110, which, as I said on Wikipedia, does not have an AV version, they would instead have an HPV card, which stood for high-performance video, even though it was not high-performance, like at all. There was no graphics acceleration or anything like that. It was better described as a VRAM expansion card. The 7100 card with 1 megabyte VRAM and the 8100 with 2 megabytes. Each with the capacity to further double the VRAM. The 8100 card was expandable to 4 megabytes for about $200. One odd but important warning Apple gave regarding the 7100 and 8100 was to never operate the computer without a card in the PDS slot. Even if you have to put a Terminator card in there, you should not leave it empty. Opening the case and seeing this does not give me much hope. Oh, what the hell? You had the option of using the motherboard video port. That one used 615K of system RAM for video instead of dedicated VRAM. The port was an HDI45 port carrying video, audio, and ADB to the proprietary Apple display. If you didn't have this display, you'd need the FAT adapter to use the port. The only real benefit to this port on an 8100 is that you could connect a second monitor, making them the first Macs that could drive two monitors without adding additional hardware. The 8100 marked the end of the AV designations. The 8500 built in the AV card, which tidied up the back and was a much more elegant design. The onboard RAM is 8 megabytes. Same as all the first Power Mac motherboards, but expandable to 264 megabytes with four paired banks. To hit max RAM, you'd need to add 32 megabyte SIMs, which were hard to find in 94. 64 megabyte SIMs would become available in 1995, but a pair costs more than the 8100 itself. So forget that. This machine I got has all the banks filled, so it might be maxed. The RAM was the 72 pin SIMs, which needed to be added in identical pairs and probably no longer sold. No, Walmart, you obviously don't carry that. For 110 AV, what? In the initial Power Mac lineup, the 256K L2 cache was standard only on the 8180. But with the 1995 speed bump, it was installed on all Power Macs. And with the new 100 MHz 8100, you could get the optional one megabyte cache which one did this have? Neither. Cash was taken from this one. Why? Okay, at least I have a spare from a 6100 parts machine. This card would almost double the transfer rate between memory and CPU, which typically increased the system performance 20%. Not bad. 
The neighboring card is the ROM, identical for all models, 6100, 7100, 8100. Burned into this 4 megabyte ROM is Gary Davidian's famous emulator, taking up only half a megabyte. Nice job, Gary. The 100 and 110 MHz 8100 had updated ROMs due to changes in the new bus controller and such, so I'm glad this card wasn't missing. All 601 chips were produced by IBM, none by Motorola, despite these early promo graphics. The PowerPC 601 RISC chip design was released to go head to head with the Intel Pentium already on the market. The fastest clock Pentium you could buy when Apple released the 8100 was 66 MHz which made 80 megahertz a very impressive number. Try to beat that. It can't be done. Hey, hey, hey. The advantage of the RISC technology is not that the old technology is bad. Chips like the 68000, the x86, those chips are fine. They continue to be fine. But what you see when they're moved to the new generation of performance, like the Pentium chip, is that chip is very large, it's very complex, it's very expensive. So yes, you can push the old architectures forward, but it gets increasingly difficult to do. The advantage of going to risk is you really start to the ground floor of a new architecture. There's been a lot of words said about our competitors uh, and their risk chips and their attempts to come after the mainstream personal computer market. But the bottom line is that uh, they're starting from zero in terms of a software base and they're trying to build up. And the Intel architecture and the Pentium chip runs all 50,000 of those software applications and runs it at full speed. So we don't really see the risk chips as being uh, much competition in terms of the mainstream personal computer market. The heat from Pentium warms a mid-sized town. Despite each side's confidence that their CPU strategy would win out, this battle for chip supremacy would continue to play out for another decade. <clears throat> Something that artists have to do every day. There's just no hiding the truth here. Well, I said it was the fastest Pentium money can buy, not the fastest computer money can buy. Macintosh You're is done. done. Ironically, the tables turned on Apple toward the end of the PowerPC era. Okay, this is the last of the PowerPC, the G5 quad-core, Apple's first quad-core machine. Again, fan removal is toolless. You just pull it out. Wait, is this... Is this a car rad cooling the CPU? The heat from these G5s would like warm a mid-sized town. The 68K AV models introduced the GeoPort. It was the standard modem port, but with an extra pinout carrying five volts. The idea was to use it to power the GeoPort telecom adapter sold separately in place of a modem. The adapter let the highly advertised digital signal processor in the AV Mac handle the analog to digital conversion work. And in the Power Macs, the task was handed off to the CPU itself. The advantage being protocols could be updated in software, whereas a modem was locked to the speed that you bought it at. Also with software, you could use your Mac as a fax machine, answering machine, speakerphone, Though it turned out most didn't like this setup and preferred to keep these functions as dedicated equipment, separate from the computer. I hope things aren't messed up and I lose all my data, mister. You gotta answer to me. The 8100 included the Apple Design mouse and Plain Talk microphone. The keyboard you pay for, double speed CD-ROM was optional, and it was the popular 300i model, the I standing for internal. In this case, it was the 300i plus, meaning it was a tray loader instead of having to use a caddy. This 100 megahertz shipped with the new system 7.5. And if you ordered your 8100 with the CD-ROM drive, the OS came on CD rather than floppy. And for whatever reason, it was a different set of floppies for the higher end models than what came with the 6100. So what were people doing with the 8100 back then? There were games. No, no kid. The 8100 was too expensive to be a games machine. But speaking of games, Marathon was released in December 1994. Like many applications, it was released as a fat binary, 
I mean it contained both 68K and PowerPC versions in one file. The native PowerPC applications had this symbol on the box, meaning it was written for the RISC processor and not relying on the emulator. This made the 8100 the ultimate machine to play Marathon on. The beauty of the 8100, you could play your older 68K games and these new PowerPC games. Well, not Starship Titanic, it required a 120 megahertz processor. And Unreal? <laughs> no. Otherwise, using your pen... What is this? Oh, that's a book. But come to think of it, 1984 would have made a good game. There is no loyalty except loyalty to the party. There is no love except love of Big Brother. All competing pleasures we will destroy. Ah! Time for some payback. Your next big brother. Get out of here. You're not even in this game. Definitely a missed opportunity here. Also, desktop publishing was big. Would it surprise you to learn that in five industries, advertising, graphic design, printing, publishing, and free press services, 80% of all computers are Macintosh? Well, no, it doesn't surprise me because over the last 25 years, the situation hasn't changed much. Apple had dominated the desktop publishing market for just under 10 years at that point. Even if I go back to my high school physics exam from January 1985, you see the unmistakable Macintosh Geneva font appear with elements of Cairo for diagrams. Okay, why is the creepy music playing? Otherwise, using your Power Mac for leisure mostly meant reference CD-ROMs, so-called multimedia, which was just hitting its stride. By far, the most compelling reason to buy a CD-ROM drive has been the ability to access the electronic encyclopedia and other essential reference books. Indeed, Microsoft's bookshelf has been a perennial bestseller. The titles in the digital library are poised to become the new standard for retrieving and analyzing information and data in the electronic age. No, they won't. Which brings us to the internet. <laughs> nice going, bookshelf. It's as if there's a million computers on the internet inside your own personal computer. Yeah, no one's impressed by that anymore. In 94, the internet was still pretty niche, and the World Wide Web was in its infancy. Most would choose online services like CompuServe or AOL. So these days, finding, say, online video to watch on a vintage 8100 is kind of unlikely. However, a website, Cornica, has changed that. A website dedicated to hosting a variety of interesting videos that have been optimized for internet-connected PowerPC and even 68K Macs. And it allows you to simply what we call net surf, looking for cool stuff. That's what the kids say they're doing. Along with the interesting videos, he's even posted some of my videos there, which is really cool. So check that out on March 14th, Give him some feedback and let him know if he can refine October 14th, 1995. Okay, you're doing it again. The 8100 would be dethroned by the PowerPC 604 based 9500 in June 1995, outperforming it by a wide margin. The 8100 was soon to be replaced by the 120 MHz 8500, also with a 604 processor in August 1995. You know, someone once asked me, Aren't you glad you bought a Power Macintosh? And I would say yes, my 6100 lasted me over five years. And this 8100 was a pretty interesting teardown. 
Now, if only I could get it to work. None of the standard troubleshooting changed anything. Unfortunately, I don't think I'll pull this one off. The power supply works, but that's about it. Not even a chime. Hey, you're in the shot. Okay, let's circle back and check my Wikipedia correction. Take pride in the small contribution I made. Wait, the log says it's been revised again. There were AV variants for all models. And they added a 110 av to the model list. It's even worse now than it was before. Damn! Okay, now that the casual viewers are gone, I have an exciting update about the museum. No, not my self-proclaimed Mac museum, the local oil museum. I went back there for the first time since 1998. This time I went with my son. They had just reopened after repairing the centerpiece drive wheel that operated the 19th century oil field. 10 horsepower. Um, it runs 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We never shut it off. Um, the only time it ever does turn off is if there's a power outage. It had rotted out and it took a lot of work, time, and money to repair it. After years of the previous management, or mismanagement, the museum in general had fallen into disrepair, and they've been working hard to bring it back. And I got this book breaking down the history of the museum itself. The first and only printing in 2000. You can tell by the rusty stable. So why is this book important? When we went to the museum in 98, we got a peek of the first draft of this book as part of the extended tour. Let's take a look. Is this little dance part of the tour too, or? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Children raising an understanding deer for their environment. And crude. <laughs> the idea was to get local school children involved in, and interested in the Petroya discovery. An elementary school class would sponsor a deer, and in return they could come to the site to see it and feed it. After contacting administrators at Storybook Gardens, Metro Zoo, and Rainland to discuss deer species, it was decided to get seek a deer. A 3 meter, 10 foot chain link fence was erected and the four deer finally arrived. However, after only six hours of being in the pen, the deer had wriggled the way under the fence and were on their way to freedom. <laughs> Over 30 volunteers on foot and in planes were armed with shortwave radios and tranquilizer dart guns searching for the lost deer. The local media immediately picked up on the story and the local media. was all over the newspapers. One deer was recaptured and after a week of chasing the Phantom 3, search efforts were deserted. A week of chasing these deer. <laughs> There were concerns. They didn't give up to eat. Listen, there were there were concerns for the sole deer in the pen, nicknamed Lonesome. So several companions were brought in to keep him company. The deer pen soon included a few sheep, a goat, and two llamas. <laughs> so, oh, it'd be such a good idea to bring these deer in for the children. They bring the deer in, put the fence up, the deer escape. And again, it has they go after him with guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Got back in my buddy's 1983 Chevette and hit the road. Big wheels rolling, gotta keep them going. Big wheels rolling, moving on. 